let's get started. Apologies for the delay. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to announce Sarah Maglikan, uh, who is here today to uh, talk to us. Sarah is an assistant professor at the Informatics Institute at the University of Amsterdam, as well as a research scientist at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Important to know. <laughs> She got her uh, PhD uh, uh, from U of U University uh, in 2017, working on uh, logics for causal inference under uncertainty, uh, and did uh, postdocs uh, uh, in between at also IBM and working with Joris, right? Her current research focus is on causality-inspired machine learning. So that means uh, applications to causal inference to machine learning and particularly transfer learning and formally safe reinforcement learning. So someone giving guarantees. Um, she uh, wrote to me a lot of work that I will be mentioning is with Joris. So I think it is, will be a good introduction to some of the things uh, the Mercury, Mercury Lab might want to continue doing. So I'm very hopeful that this will be uh, very nice uh, uh, for all of in, in terms of content. And uh, yeah, given uh, that I have personal experience with, with Sarah uh, going back about 10 years now, I think, when I, th I think we first met in, in this project meeting, um, and I was uh, 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 immediately impressed with the amount of energy and enthusiasm that she, she brought and uh, mm -hmm. ever since when I met her. So I think we, uh, we are in for a treat. So I hope you will help me welcome Sarah. Sarah, take it away. So, thank you. I, I feel a bit bad because I don't know what you guys have been talking the whole day, and I'm also not sure where to look or position myself. So, I'll, that's the camera. camera. Okay, no problem. So, I just want to keep it. Good. I know, but thank you. I'm, I'm fine. I'm just, I fidget. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an anxious person, so I fidget. So, as uh, Franz mentioned, I'm at the University of Amsterdam, but I'm also part time at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. And uh, I'm going to talk about causality inspired machine learning, which is something I'll describe a bit in a few slides. And uh, in particular, we'll talk about the domain adaptation case, which is some work we did with Yaris. So first I'll talk in general about why causality, I think, personally is useful for machine learning, especially for distribution shifts. Then I'll talk about the domain adaptation work we did. And then I'll give a bit of a, like just a sneak peek in some of the newer work that I've been doing. And hopefully I will not take too much time. So uh, first I'll talk about this, like this is let's say my point of view actually yeah sorry i don't know if you guys can see so let me know if i have to move if you cannot see the slides um so um the idea is that uh, i'm going to argue that real world machine learning so real machine learning or real data uh, needs to deal with several things for example bias data uh, fairness selection biases you saw generalization issues issues with heterogeneous data which are not ID. Um, and it actually tries to find actionable insights, not just correlations, but causation. So all of these issues are covered, at least, or are at least tackled in causal inference. So in causal inference, there are some tools on how to do systematic data fusion, how to reuse bias data, and in a sense, how to work on non-IID data. And causal inference is specifically a systematic way to extract actionable insights. So actionable insights, I mean, how do you decide how to do a policy? So not just, you know, predicting what's happening, but deciding how to do interventions. So up to now, this is, you know, mainstream, especially after, you know, if you ever seen some, anything from the Um Now I'm going to talk about something slightly less mainstream. So I'm going to argue that full causality, and in this I mean to find the unique causal graph, sometimes it's too expensive or not necessary. For example, uh, in some cases, you do need to do a lot of experiments to fully identify the graph because in general, from observational data, there are multiple graphs that fit the data, so you don't know which one is the true one. And so instead, I'm going to talk about this causality inspired, uh, which is if you've ever been in US, you have things that are you know, lemon infused, which do not contain lemon. So this is causality inspired. It doesn't necessarily need to contain causality. But it can use ideas for causality. It can. It can help. We can argue Yoris. So Yoris so is kind of uh, disagreeing. But it doesn't necessarily need to be identifiable to be able to actually um, provide insights that are useful for robustness and, and for distribu to distribution shifts. And specifically, as I mentioned, I'm just going to give an example here in the second part of the talk on domain adaptation. But I, I wanted to mention there is lots of related work. 
So I'll let you continue the other work, obviously, uh, including in, in your research group. So I'm going to start with this kind of analogy between transfer learning and causal inference. So transfer learning is notoriously not very, very vaguely defined, talking about things that are vaguely defined. So I'm going to use this example, and I'm going to say that transfer learning is about predicting what happens when the distribution changes. For example, we have a self-driving car that is staying in the US, and we want it also to work in the UK, and you know, people drive on the different side of the road. So this would be an example of transfer learning, how can we ensure that you know, the self-driving car still works. And I'm going to argue that in causality, if we have, we're answering very similar questions, and one of the questions is, how can I predict what happens when the distribution changes, but in this case, after an intervention? And there are many works on perfect interventions. So Judea Perl has developed the good calculus, and there are several works on this. In a perfect intervention, there are many definitions, but the simplest one is that you fix a variable to a value. And specifically, you want that the variable that you're intervening on acts is independent of its parents. But in this talk, I'll talk about something else. I'll talk about soft interventions on a variable x. And in practice, this means that I'm going to change essentially the mechanism I'm computing x from its parents. And I'm also going to argue that this is very general. And since it's very general, it can model also things that are not interventions. For example, if you have data from one lab and data from another lab, the data from the second lab, they may be both observational, but you could consider that the difference is a soft intervention between them. So even if they're not, whatever this means, real interventions. And so I'm going to also argue that soft interventions and transfer learning, they have a connection. And this is not a new idea. And this is, I wanted to stress this. So this is a paper um, from SML 2012, in which several people, including Joris, have discussed, um, so this is a famous paper on causal and anti-causal learning, and they are discussing, and here it's like the excerpt, uh, extract, that several things that people do in transfer learning, they could be um, seen as a causal problem or an anti-causal problem. And so this is from 2012, but since there have been several papers, and this is just a subset of them. So I'm, here I'm saying many, many more, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, I did select them somehow in a, in a way that it would be clear in a few slides. But all of these papers I argue, and I think other people may argue too, is that they argue that causality allows us to reason systematically about distribution shifts. And this is maybe more for the book of some people. I wanted to you know, point out that this is not purely academic. So this is for Google Brain, this is from you know, IBM, Microsoft Research, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, or Meta now. So this is like an interest that you know, was also through in, to in kind of industrial use cases. And so I selected the papers in a way that you know, fits my personal bias towards graphs. So all of these papers, they do help us reason systematically about distribution shifts through graphs. And so you have all these kind of different, slightly different graphical representations. And so in the next few slides, I will try to describe at least how some of these representations you could interpret them and how they can help you to reason and kind of um, avoid certain common misperceptions that people do have about transfer learning. And, you know, causality allows us to reason systematically about distribution shifts through graphs, even if the graphs are unknown, which is several of these papers actually. Um, discuss the case in which the graphs are unknown. And in, in our paper, we also discussed even if you cannot reconstruct the Markov Venus class. So even if you have some missing data, essentially. So now I'm going to give you a description of the main allocation tasks. So I think the first two are quite standard descriptions, definitions. And then the third one is one I would use through the talk, but other people might disagree. So we can, I'll just give you my definition and then we can see what you guys think about it. So this is a task of supervised multi-source domain adaptation. So we have some source domains. For example, we have some data from some mines. We have some features. We have a label, Y. And then we have uh, multi-source means that we have potentially multiple sources. So you have data from just normal mice. You have data from mice, which was an intervention was performed, for example, a, you know, a gene knockout. So the distribution is different. And then you have some target domains. So you have some other mice in which a different knockout was performed. So the distribution has changed, but we don't know exactly how. And so in this case, we do have some data, some labels in the target domain. So that's called supervised multi-source domain adaptation. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict the labels in the case which we don't have. And so the task is to estimate the label Y from the features X1, X2, X4. Uh, using the source domains and the labels we have in the target domains. 
So this is supervised. The unsupervised case is just we don't have any label in the target domain. So we cannot even see how the if there is like you know how the label has shifted in the target domain because we have all the labels are missing in the target domain. And so what we will try to focus on is in or in this task, in this talk, will be actually this case of unsupervised multi-source domain annotation. And we'll show how you can use the data from the target, from the sources, and some of the data from the target, essentially to try to see how you can predict this in a robust way. Okay. And then there is another task that I'm not going to talk much about, but I think a lot of people are interested in, and it's called domain generalization. And this is the most big task. And I, th I think it's generally quite ill-defined. So in a way, I will use it during this talk, but you know, people disagree. So um, I'm, I'll use it as, this means that we don't have any data in the target domain. So we have some source domains for which we have labeled data. Then we have, don't have any data in the target domain, and we're trying to use the source data to transfer to this new unknown domain. We don't know anything about it. We don't even know how the features have shifted. Nothing. And I'm going to essentially assume that there's an underlying causal system. Um, and in this case, in the new target domain, um, is it working? In the new target domain, there can be essentially any intervention on any of the features. And I'm going to kind of disallow that there's an intervention in why otherwise I think the problem is imposed. Um, so this is a way to try to tackle this, the thing that I call domain generalization. So there is some work, as I mentioned, there is also like work from 2013 from Kun Zhang et al. on domain adaptation from a graphical perspective. And the idea, and here I'm just going to give you a, a little example. Uh, one of the ideas is that you can have, again, you have just normal mice, and then you have mice in which gene A was intervened. So each of these rows is a mouse. Is a, and each of these columns is a measurement. And we have the features X1 and X2, and we have a label Y. So now these are samples from two different distributions. So in order to kind of put them together, I'm going to do a very simple trick that you know, probably people do anyway. I'm going to add a variable D. And this variable D will be, you know, for example, zero in the normal mice and one in the mice in which gene A was in, intervened on. And now I'm just going to pretend, since I added this variable D, I'm just going to pretend that all the samples come from a distribution in which we have the features X, Y, X, Y, and D. And so I can represent this as, as a kind of pseudo uh, single distribution, and then I can represent a causal graph on both the two distributions. And this D variable, the domain, is essentially encoding how uh, the distribution of the features shift, shifts across the different domains. So the domains here are you know, normal mice and mice in which uh, gene perturbation was performed. Uh, if you have any questions, then you can. So this, this is an intervention. <laughs> yeah, it's a, in this case, there could be an intervention, but we don't know exactly what the intervention does. So there is a gene knockout. We know the distribution is different, but we don't know what happened. But this could easily be that they are just mice from different labs. So just normal mice, but they are from different labs. So maybe there is just the way these are measured, it may have a bias. From the formalism point of view, the fact that there is an action or not, it just doesn't matter because it, we're just talking about if the distribution changes or not, because we don't know how the action works. Well, but, okay, but so there's no unknown confounder pointing into P. Yeah, that's true. So we do have some assumptions that there are no confounders. Uh, between these variables that I will explain a bit later, uh, and the, indeed, that's true. So then it counts. Yeah, and also the there is no answer. there is no causal. Generally, we assume there is no um, causal kind of connection between these variables and D either, so they cannot cause this. So let's assume we can represent this data with this graph. This graph can be also unknown. And after now, you're like, okay, sure, I I can do that, but why do I care? And you know what I'm going to argue right now. Um, hopefully, uh, is that if, even if we don't know the graph, we can still use things like the separation and condition analysis, which maybe you think I've mentioned before, hopefully, uh, to reason about invariances or somebody else, actually. Um, so just to maybe convince you a bit further that this is, you know, caution to put things together, because I know people sometimes are thinking either it's trivial or it's like just not okay to put different distributions together. This is an example I have with a structural puzzle model. So this is a set of equations. We have three sets of equations. And the only difference between each of them is that 
the equation for x2 is different. So here x2 is minus y plus some noise. Here x2 is one. So this is like a perfect intervention x2, fixing it one. And here x2 is 10 times y. And so you can represent these three fractional causal models with a unique fractional causal model. And we just have d as the domain as another variable. So, so this is the graph you get from the fractional causal model. Um, so you would take essentially for each of the variables, you would take any of the variables on the right hand side as the parents of the variable. So x1 doesn't have any parent. Y has x1 as a parent. So there is an entity from this. And in this case, x2 has y as a parent. So there's an entity from them. And x3 here has y as a parent. So there's an edge from y to x3. And then d is essentially just a switch that switches the way x2 is computed because x2 changes across different environments. And I have a Jupyter notebook if you if you can't, if you're very skeptical about it, I have a Jupyter notebook for that. Yeah. Is it supposed to be a plus epsilon y in these two? In uh, plus epsilon here? Yeah, this one is probably true. Yeah. This is the typo. Okay. But besides that, the typo? Yes. There is a typo. Yeah, I will write it down later. Okay. Um, so and just to give you why we're talking about, you know, we're putting distributions together, we're talking about it because, for example, we could have the, the first two fractional causal models are our sort domains, and the third one is our target domain. And again, why do we care about that? We care about that, and here it's again, um, I'm trying to plot it with some data. I want to show that if we have, so for each of these equations, I can simulate data. So these are some data for d0, these are some data for d1, these are some data for d2. They are simulated through those equations. <coughs> and I can show that if I take, so this is y and this is x1, and this is again y and x1, y and x1, so these are in different domains, I can show the distribution is very similar. So the scatter plots look almost identical. And this is essentially, I can say that the distribution of y even this one is invariant across the domain. So it's the same in the domains, even empirically. I can say just from looking at the scatter plots. Okay. And now I'm going to try to see if y given x2 is invariant or not. So this is x2 and this is y. And so these different colors are the different domains. As, it, as you can see, so there are different lines. So the distributions of y given x2, they're fairly different, especially between the source domains and the target domain. But actually, they're different in each of them. They're three different lines, essentially. And so if I use the source domains and I try to fit a model, for example, just a linear regression, because I'm you know, very lazy, I fit the linear regression line here, and then I try to use it to predict the data in the target domain, I'll have like arbitrary errors. And so here, in this specific case, I have a very big error of 30,000. And so essentially, the distribution of y here given x2 is not the same in each of the domains. And so I can see this uh, from the data, but essentially my point is that you can see it also from the graph if you know the separation, because it's, some, it's a statement you can see from the graph. Specifically, p of y given x1, so y is here, x1 is here, p of y given x1 is invariant across the domains is the same as saying that p of y given x1 when d equals zero, when d equals one, it's the same as when d equals one, and it's the same as p of y given x1 when d equals two. two. So these are all the same. Um, this is what I told you empirically. And so this, we can also just write p of y given x1. So we can remove d because it doesn't matter. And usually you remove d when you have that y is independent of d given x1. So this is how conditional dependencies help you to simplify. Um, Conditional distributions. And so this independence here holds in this data empirically, but I can tell you, and this is, I'm not going to go into the separation because I don't think I'm able to explain it very well, very quickly. But essentially, I can tell you that if you did know the graph, you could read that y is this separated from d given x1 in, the, in this known graph, if you did know the graph. And this separation is um, under some assumptions a way to read conditional independences. So just to give you an idea, so here it's y. There is this path from y to x2 to d. This is the only path. And the path is closed because x2 is a collider. And if I condition on x1, which is here, x1 does not open any path. So I know that y is this separated from d given x1. 
And if I know it's this separated, I know it's also independent. And if I know it's independent, I know that the distribution is invariant. So essentially, things that are independent with the domain are things that are invariant with the domain. France? Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, also, at dinner, if there is no time. Um, yeah? No, OK, good. I just need uh, to take a question. Yeah, good. And just to give you, like, just to like really, really hammer the point, it's always the same point. Um, so P of Y given X2 is not invariant precisely because uh, we have Y, which has this path through X2 to D. So when I condition on X2, essentially this path is open. So Y is deconnected to D. And that's why, because we assume deconnections and uh, conditional dependencies are one to one, that's why we know that, for example, X2 is not a good predictor, it could bias our prediction if you use X2 to try to uh, predict Y in different domains. And this is called the supervisor bias. So it's not, it's a well-known thing. And this is all assuming that we do know the graph. And then the task will be, if we do know the graph, the task is to find things that are separating. We call them separating features. So I'll explain in a few slides. So the separating features are features that have this property that de-separate Y from D. So subset of features that de-separate Y from D. This is what we're looking for. Um, so this is, and the idea is that we want to look for this because then we know that the distribution of P of Y, given these features S, is invariant because of the mix. That's what we care about. And just to give you an idea for uh, domain generalization, so in the domain generalization case, I'm going to assume that essentially every feature can change. So there are edges everywhere. Um, does anybody have an idea uh, which features now would disappearate? D and Y, not 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 yours, <laughs> but Philip can. <laughs> so we have this. So it's a bit small. Sorry about that. But how do you separate this? And you know there are edges everywhere. From this other one here, this one from this one. Well, not eh? X one indeed, and X one is the is a parent. So for example, if you use the parent, you can do that. And so that's why a lot of people, for example, invariant discrimination, et cetera, a lot of the people who do, who try, attempt to do the minimization, do look for the causal parents because they hope that then it can protect them against at least some things they haven't observed. So at least this is, um, I don't know if they do it consciously, but this is implicitly what they're trying to do. And so that's what I'm going to say that, you know, minimization is like doing an intervention and dividing except why. I think this is a, one of the few well defined ways to discuss minimization. Otherwise, it's very, very. So need to know what you're talking about. Indeed, yes. I have an example for that. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So, so just one, one, yes. one uh, uh, clarification. So if you say is invariant, you mean is invariant across domains. Yes, when I, uh, sorry, when I say is invariant, I meant the distribution is the same in the different domains. Yes, indeed. And so up to now, I just wanted to mention this again. I think people in causality knew it. Uh, at least Kuhn has known it for 10 years. But they haven't necessarily communicated it uh, very well. We can argue whether I did, but you know, uh, this is something I wanted to maybe really point out if you haven't ever heard about it. And so, as you already mentioned, um, we're coming to that. One of the things that I think using graphs will allow you to see and thinking in terms of this separation is that, for example, something that is invariant in some source domains, it doesn't mean that it's going to be invariant in that other domain. So a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, train my um, computer vision method to be invariant to some certain data augmentations or certain different domains, and then it will work always. And then whatever I'm learning is going to be causal. And that's not, that's not necessarily true. So this is an example in which we have uh, the domain here um, shifts the variable x1. This one is visible, right? Not like the others, okay. But here x2, for example, is not shifted by the domain. And so we have, I wrote them as independences, but we have uh, two um, disseparation statements that you can read. So Y is disseparated from D when I condition X1, because this path here is blocked. And adding also X2 doesn't really change. So you can have X1 or X1 and X2. So you could think if you by chance find X1 and X2, that this means that you know, um, X1 and X2 are both parents of Y. And this is a bit one of the issues that people had when they were trying to use invariant discriminization. They were finding independences and said, oh, it's independent across some domains. This means that it's causal 
and that's a misconception. So if you want that, it needs to be independent across, quote unquote, all domains or across all kind of possible um, interventions in a sense. So you need to be careful about that, not just some domains, it has to be uh, better formalized. And I think in the variant risk minimization paper, they have like some theorem in which they show under which types of environments they needed to have actually causality. Otherwise, it's just invariant. So something is invariant across some domains doesn't mean it's necessarily a causal. And uh, yeah, here I'm, yeah, I'm really iterating this point because I was getting annoyed by people not getting it. Uh, but just to give you uh, an idea, there are methods which do use invariances, and specifically invariant causal prediction uh, from Peter Setal, which do actually exploit this, but then they have to, you have to do something a bit more careful. And so this is a way to write invariant causal prediction is you want to have essentially the intersection of all of the sets that have this property. So you want to find the sets S such that they de-separate Y from D, but then you are going to take the intersection of these sets. And then those sets, you'll see that you find a subset of the parents of Y. And in this specific example, uh, you have X1 that de-separates Y and D, and X1 and X2 that de-separates Y and D. So if you take the intersection, you get X1, which is the parent. And so there are some caveats uh, when is a parent or an ancestor, but let's say, let's assume no latent confounding in for now, then you can do this and you get the parent or a subset of the parent. But because it's a subset of the parents, it's not all of the parents, sometimes it can be too conservative. So if you have this example here and you have X1, this separates Y from Y and X2, this separates Y, D from Y and both of them also do that. You do the intersection of all of these sets and the intersection is the empty set. And technically the empty set is a subset of the parent because the empty set is a subset of everything, uh, technically. So, so this is a bit, uh, there are some caveats, but invariant features are not necessarily causal. You have to be careful and there are people who have talked about it, how to do it in a certain way. So this is the summary. And this is more to the point of the audience. If you do have latent confounding, so if you have like here, there is a hidden variable that causes both X2 and Y, then uh, if you take X2, which is a causal parent of Y, this is not necessarily enough. It's not like, um, so D is not de-separated when you condition X2 from Y, because essentially there is, if you know the separation, there is a path here that gets open to the fact that X2 is a collider. But if you don't know, just trust me on that, and you know, you can go and check uh, the separation later. So essentially you can use this separation to reason about things. And if there is latent confounding, you may want to use other things which are not necessarily present parents. Uh, and if you want to do the majorization and latent confounding, I think you probably need more assumptions because otherwise you cannot do it. And so the summary of these two common misconceptions is that, that if you use a graph, things that look complicated become very apparent, at least to me, um, with very reasoning graphical models. And that causality, so using the parents is neither necessary and not, not sufficient under latent confounding for transfer. So that's why I care more about conditional independencies than necessarily causality in this setting. So then, okay, so this was like, this concludes more or less the general idea, this separation is cool and you should use it for uh, distribution sheets. And if you didn't get anything of this stuff, just go and look at the separation and try to use uh, D as a domain in your graphs and see what happens, or you know, maybe carefully see what happens. Uh, and this is more about the things we worked on with the audience, like the specific example. And so I wrote this desiderata for a causality inspired domain notation method. It's a bit cheeky because obviously it's written a posteriori given what our method actually does. So in the end, we have a lot of checkpoints, obviously, but just to give you an idea, um, I wanted essentially to have something that um, is able to find, so we want to be able to find dissipating features um, when the graph is unknown. And we also want to allow for latent confounders. And we want to somehow want to try to avoid parametric assumptions. Um, so our method does not have a parametric assumptions, but they're in a sense baked in condition balance tests. <laughs> so this is a bit um, with a caveat. We don't have parametric assumptions, but that's the point. And this is, I think, what distinguishes it from other work. So we don't want to have just one domain variable. We want to have multiple context variables. It, it, and maybe Philip uh, Buchan has already explained this. I'm not sure. But otherwise, in case, I will just give a short example. 
And having these different context variables, okay, allows us to distinguish between the target separately and a mixture of the sources. I think this is a very simple point, but I think it's like kind of crucial to for our method and actually to improve uh, transfer in multi-source and annotation cases. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah, this should be okay. Okay, so and I want to also assume I kind of avoid an assumption that if something is invariant across multiple source domains, then it's invariant also in the target domain, uh, which is a bit of a subtle point. But we'll see, we'll talk about it. So we had a, some work in uh, New York 2018, and we had work was on uh, unsupervised multi source domain adaptation. So we had some normal mice, some mice with some gene modification on gene A, and then we had some mice in which another gene, gene D, was modified. And what predict the labels in that case? And so we're going to use multiple context variables, C1, C2, and et cetera. And specifically, we'll have C1 equals one represent the target domain. I'm going to explain how they're going to be used. And we're going to assume that the shift is will represent it as a soft intervention. And we have some other assumptions that I will describe a bit later. So now the graph is unknown. Before we had the graph, if I had the graph, I can think about the separations and it works. If I do not have the graph, then we start having a bit more problems. So um, we're going to use this framework, joint causal inference, uh, also from Yoris, and uh, you know, we work with Yoris on it and from Kaplan. And then um, we're going to represent. So this joint causal inference framework essentially is the idea of instead of having one domain variable, we're going to kind of uh, split it in multiple context variables. So the paper is a bit more complicated than uh, what I'm going to explain now, but just to trivialize the work, in a sense, uh, what you can think about it is you have different distributions. We're going to add these context variables, C1, C2, and they will essentially be encoding the just indicators for the domain. So we can, in a sense, encode uh, C1 equals one in domain one, and C2 equals one in domain two. And this one we call domain zero just for simplicity. So, and you know, you, you obviously this could be also, they, they have the same role as the domain um, variable we had before, but we're separating them because we want to specifically disentangle the target domain, we, as we will see. And now we're going to use the C variables. We're going to treat them as normal random variables. They aren't, so we're adding them, but we'll pretend they are. And then we can use methods that work on observational data with these variables. And we can even help these methods by adding them some background knowledge. For example, that the variables we added cannot be caused by the other variables. Or, and this is like an assumption that you mentioned, Franz, that there is no co-founding between the system variables, so the normal variables, and these context variables that we added. There is no co-founding between them. This is something you can add as an assumption into a causal inference method and it will work. And you can, it's a framework that you can use with multiple methods. And if it's, there is no missing data, we get something like a Markov Nielsen's class. So we get a set of different graphs. Uh, but the problem is, in our case, we do have missing data. Mm. So I'm going to talk about the separating features, uh, which, as I mentioned, are sets of features that disseparate y from the context variable c1. And this is what essentially what we're going to try to find when you don't know the graph. And now we don't know the graph, then we could think maybe we can just test these condition dependencies because in the end we care about condition dependencies in the data. So can I check if x1, this is condition dependent of y given c1, so this separates in a sense y and c1. And the problem is I never have y um, when c1 is on. So I have like missing data, not just at random, I have consistently missing data in our target domain because we're doing unsupervised domain allocation. So we cannot just test it in the data. And one solution that other people have thought about, so this is Rojas Caruya and others, it's called invariant models for causal transfer learning. One possibility is that if you have different source domains, you're going to try to see uh, which features, for example, X1, this separates from Y from the domain in the source domains. And if it works in the source domains, I'm just going to assume it implies it will also work in the target domain. Uh, and this is in general not true. So I have an example here that I think we probably don't have time to go specifically now, but we can talk about it in the discussion. Uh, and the plots I have in this example, the green plots, are the things that are the distributions in the source domains. And you can see that for both x1 here and x2 here, these distributions look the same. 
But when I add the target domain data, which are these blue ones, uh, for x1, the distribution still looks the same. And for x2, the distribution is very different. And so you have cases in which you think, uh, so things that do not change in the source domain may still change in the target domain. So you have to be careful about it. And essentially our method is able to also use the data from the target domain. So this method here uh, kind of throws away the data from the target domain conceptually. Instead, we're going to use both the data from the source domains, but also this data from the target domain. So the idea in the end was that we, we used a lot of condition independence tests and we tried essentially with the theorem proving to see if they imply the one that we wanted. Um, we have some very technical assumptions that maybe are a bit too technical for now, but again, we can discuss. One important point is that why cannot have an arrow pointing into it from any, from the, at least the target context domain and in general from the domain. Uh, we have some assumptions on how you can transfer some conditional dependencies from one domain to the others. Here I have an example that we won't go through. So did, we actually did an example, we proved it by hand in the, in the paper, but in practice, uh, you don't want to for every conditional dependence test prove for every graph, which are the features that will work. So instead of doing that, we use a theorem prover. That's the, that was the, the thing that I was really into. And so, so what we had, we had a theory, we had the assumptions that are technical, but we can discuss later. We had all the condition independence tests we could do on the data, including, including the ones which had this C2, so the context variables. And then we had, we used the logic encoding from Kitten and Atal of this separation. So this allows us to reason about this separation. And when I say reason, I mean properly reason for the prover. So this is answer set programming. So you can prove things. And the theorem prover is just a uh, thing if you're interested in it. Anyway, given a set, we could show that something is provably separating, which means we can guarantee that the distribution of y, so the distribution of y given x1 does not change in the target domain. So we can prove it. Uh, we can prove this the dash change. Or in some cases, we couldn't know if it changes or not because there were multiple thousand graphs that fitted these other condition dependencies. So we weren't sure whether X1 would be satisfying the separating feature set. So the, the, separate, the, the separation that we're looking for would hold in the true photograph. So I think we're, we're almost there. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm going to speed up a bit. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's we're almost there. We're, we're good. We're, yes, we're good. Uh, okay, so, so essentially we have, like, we have this magic box that if you ask me, like, uh, if you, for a feature, X1, uh, given a set of condition dependencies, uh, you ask whether x1, y given x1 is uh, invariant across domains in the target domain or not. Even if there is no y in the target domain, so under some assumptions we can prove it is always invariant, in some assumptions we can prove it's never invariant, and in some assumptions we can, we can be agnostic because we don't know. So we say, I don't know. So these are the three cases. So given this magic box that tells us which features are, you know, safe, uh, we essentially kind of combined this with a feature selection algorithm in the paper, and the feature selection algorithm was, you know, uh, random forest. So we choose sets of features through random forest, which have the lowest source domain loss. And I wanted to point out that the features also included these extra variables that we added, these context variables. And then essentially the idea was just take, you know, the greedily, the best set of features in the source domain, and see if it's probably separating or not, and then just iterate until you find one. And the idea of this would be that at some point you find a set, so you try the first one, it didn't work, you try the second one, it didn't work. I know the second one here worked. Um, so if you do find something that you can prove is safe, then you can use this set of features, learn on your source domain data, and then you have like some kind of bounded generalization error in the target domain. And so this is essentially what we want. And now, uh, maybe to kind of summarize a bit, um, the desiderata I talked about in the beginning, some of them like being able to represent changes with an unknown causal graph, allowing for profound founders, avoiding parametric assumptions, and being able to distinguish the source domain from the different, uh, so the target domain from the different source domains. This is all we could do through using essentially joint target inference. And then additionally, we also could do uh, these other two tasks, which were, trying to essentially use also data from the target, so label data from the target, 
in order to avoid the assumption that things that work in the source domains that are invalid in the source domains would also be invalid in the target without looking. So we're actually going to look at the dependent target. And specifically, we only care about things that work in the current test domain. So we look at the test domain and we find things that work in the current test domain. We're not trying to find things that would protect us against everything. So we don't have a self-driving car that is trying to work anywhere on any planet in the solar system. We have a self-driving car that is you know, trained in US, and then we have a label data in UK, and then we try to see how it would work in UK. It doesn't necessarily need to work in other places as well. It's a kind of a very specific task. And we don't need to find the causal graph or neither the equivalence class, which is what people usually do in terms of discovery. And that's why I'm saying this because I was inspired. We have a lot of limitations. Otherwise, you know, we would be done. We can go home. We have to solve because of the limitations. Uh, so some of the some of the limitations is that you know we have these three cases. You can prove it's separating. You can prove it's not separating, or you're unknown. And uh, sometimes maybe really having something that is you can prove it's separating, seeing that it's you know formal set enforcement, and sometimes it may be a bit too strict, so too conservative. So you may throw away some of the features which are perfectly good and predictive, uh, just because you think they might not be actually um, safe in the target domain, so that they should do a shift and bias your prediction. And so there are some ideas on how to improve on that. And one of the big problems, not just of this work, but also of the logic based encodings, is that they're not very scalable. And so they work in the order of tens of variables. And so this is one big issue that I'm you know, planning to work on, um, how to essentially try to do this approximately or how to try to scale it up. But it's a very difficult problem, so it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to look through. We do have some work. Um, so I wanted to apply this multitask reinforcement learning and sample factor and this. In the end, I didn't. Uh, but just because uh, I was working with Bi Wei Huang, and so instead of using our method, we use a related method called CD naught. And in this case, instead of having context variables, you have these thetas. And there are some slight differences. But the general framework I showed in the first part of the talk still holds. So you have a graph, and these thetas encode the changes. And so we wanted to use this method essentially to do uh, multitask enforcement learning. And so, yeah, very quickly, I'm going to discuss this. So we call it ADRL, and this is a paper in IPIR. And so we had uh, different source domains. So you, play, you can play Pong normally. You can rotate Pong and play it. You can play Pong with noise. And the idea is that from these source domains, we estimated a model which looks like a dynamic Bayesian network, although these are like latent. And so you only observe the images, the actions, and the work. And this part, the part of the state and the graph are invariant. And instead, the only thing that changes across the domains are some low dimensional parameters. And so we have a simplifying assumption that there are no new edges in the target domain. So the graph, this stays always the same. The only thing that changes, also the edges stay all the same. The only thing that changes is the values of the parameters. And so we use this to learn a policy across different source domains that is parameterized in these thetas. So then we're when we're a target, new target domain, and we have a new type of rotation. So it's still a rotation, but with a different angle. Then we can quickly estimate the angle, and we can just plug in our policy, and then we can show it out faster. And that this factor representation, so having the graph here instead of having everything fully connected, actually helps us to be more efficient. So the conclusions. Uh, by the end of the time, I guess, but this separation is you know, cool. You should know the separation if you don't know it. And it allows us also to reason about invariances and distribution shifts, which I think maybe was not the original plan, but it does. Again, not a new observation. And maybe a slightly newer observation. This is true also when you don't know the graph, which maybe people still knew, but also when you have missing data. And the deseparation logic encodings allow us to reason like they're very flexible, and I was reason a lot about these things, but they have some issues with scalability. So these are like, yeah. Thank you, Saka. Any more questions? Uh, maybe uh, from here, from the audience, Philip? Yeah, so the, yeah. how you infer whether this uh, one figure initially does both through this application? Is that true? So we have a transfer assumption. Uh, for some subset of assumptions, yeah. I can show you the slide. So you is this what you're asking, or are you asking in general? Because other, the other yeah, ones so we test. Like this to your improver. Is this combining the two sets? Yes. Uh, not, not the not the not the graph. Yeah. Okay. Because the graph is the graph is a 
think are more general, but that's a, this is a question that Phil Davis, for example, has asked when, when he did one of our talks. Mm -hmm. I think he asked Phil, but yeah, Phil. But then, then okay, yeah, so the answer is uh, it's slightly different. Just encoding is different, but uh, if you were to encode the graph with axioms in, the, in uh, answers of programming, you could use that as well. Yeah. It's just this one is has more inductive bias. So it encodes the separation axioms in Hayden. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you could do that in theory. It's a theorem pillar. You can do a lot of things. I also have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just a bit more like at an intuitive level. Yeah. Um, so, you are trying. Um, with these, these features C1, C2. So these are now kind of like features of the domain in some way. Yeah. And uh, in order to, to you know, try and, and, and do more generalization, uh, rather than, you know, treating the domain as a, a index, yes. you're now looking at its structure. Yeah. And you're, uh, to some extent, but without actually doing that, that means somehow you're trying to learn about uh, the true Bayesian network in a, a some sense here, right? Wait, well, so yeah, I, I was being a bit, so I think maybe I was a bit unclear. Like we do use still the bias that there might be an underlying cause of graph and that's why the dissipation actually allows us to infer another dissipation is missing. So there is still an idea that there's a cause of graph, but we don't know it. Does it seem like to you? Yeah, but so, 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 and because, well, to some, the, 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 the data is also, it's observational data in the end, right? We're not taking any mm -hmm. interventions. You are yeah. putting some assumptions as indeed uh, the, the the C1 and C2 are not yes. uh, uh, that, themselves influenced, and that yes. helps. But to, to some extent, it still feels like you're you're constructing now the Bayesian network uh, uh, from this observational data. Mm. Uh, so so yeah, but you're saying you're not not doing that. So so so. What, what am I missing? Like intuitively, what, why is the task different? Oh, it's just because they're more, like you, you can consider it as observational data, you just have, in a sense, multiple observational data you can assume, and the, sometimes some of the edges may be missing in some of the graphs. So we're, it, it's true, we're not doing intervention design. So the task is, uh, we also do this in causal discovery. Somebody has given us like a pile of experiments and we try to find the graph from the pile of experiments. Um, we're not designing actions, that's true, we're not doing at all. It's more like a passive version, um, but it doesn't mean, so the person could have done the action. So it doesn't mean that the, so we're kind of agnostic about whether it's intervention or not. So the graph can change in the different, in the different types of distributions. So, so, it, yeah. it, so, so is, Sorry, is it the case <laughs> that, 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 that you're, you're really somehow trying to exploit the, the context specific independence in this now particular case is, is, is that was that in the, this, in this specific case, a, a so actually that, that's, a, that's a good point we do in a sense in this specific case because of the assumptions that we have we have some kind of context specific independence but in general in the general council influence paper they're not context specific at all uh, we find dependencies across that kind of uh, span across the different domains but they're not context specific so they're not given this context given con like uh, in this context this is given independence we try to kind of formalize it together but if you're saying that some edges might be missing in some domains, yes. that that feels like a context specific independence, right? Like like yeah, well, in this particular domain, these and these edges are not present. So what what I meant is in terms of let's say, okay, let me go to the general inference part. We can space. Yeah. Um, um, so let's assume we do have in one. Domain we have x plus y, and in the other domain we have x and y are independent. If I take them together, I will get x causes y, and there is a domain here that changes the way that x and y are interacting. But the, so usually, if you have like different graphs and different domains, when you put them together, you get the union of the graphs. Yeah. And this would be maybe better explained in the structural causal model, in a sense, because in the structural causal model example I gave, sorry about the this here. So in this case, x2 is not depending, x2 here is not depending on y in this domain. But if you take the graph together or the sexual cousin model together, there is an edge. So this, this could easily represent the perfect intervention of two. It could easily be that you have 
This is observational data. Here you see the perfect intervention on X2, now X2 is fixed to one. So they can be also interventional data. Even if you don't do the interventions, you can still use interventional data. Does it make sense? Yeah, uh, I suppose so. I mean, just the Sorry, additional. I'm, <laughs> the, the additional I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it's helping what I'm saying. I'm hoping at some point we will convert. Yeah. Well, yeah, perhaps we should, should take it offline. All, all, all uh, By the way, Yuri, is it going to say something? Because I'm sure you have ideas on this as well. Oh, I think I. Uh, many questions were asked and many answers were given. Is there anything specific that's still unanswered? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I think it's uh, really, really the, the way we talk about uh, interventions and observations is honestly, it's not just confusing to you, it's been a bit confusing also to some of our reviewers. That's why, if you notice, the JCI paper which we used in the paper of 2018 is actually from 2021 because it took some time and some convincing uh, that you know uh, things can be seen mathematically as intervention or it doesn't really matter. A soft intervention doesn't really matter. Um, in this domain, if you don't know the targets and you know it's soft specifically, it doesn't give you much more information uh, than just a different graph. So, 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 so yeah. So, so my, my question is, which you know we, we can take it offline, but yeah. my question is, how is the problem yeah. the problem different from uh, uh, learning a Bayesian network? A Bayesian where network we is on have, a single distribution usually, right? Where where we have <coughs> additional C one up to whatever C yeah, variables. So, with somehow, you know, uh, uh, some prior knowledge that the C1s yes, are not it's affected not, it's not this in this way. So uh, essentially the contribution of our joint cousin interest paper is that you can get things that people thought were different, like learning graphs over different distributions with this simple trick, nearly very simple trick of the D or the context variables, it doesn't really matter. Then you can actually get it back to the situation you're saying. I see, okay. So you right. are right. You're right that in the end that's what we do, but that's, I see. So, so it, it is the formulation of the augmented model that yes. is actually the contribution. Yes, the, and, and not just the Good. formulation. The formulation is, is simple. It's more like convincing people that the formulation is okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Convincing That's like reviewers is indeed. Uh, several yeah. pieces of measure theory, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, <laughs> I, I think I, I think I got it. I think I got it. So. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I guess shall we really come to a close. Of the webinar now. Um, all right. Thank That's you all for uh, Thank you, Diana. Uh, yeah, we hope to see you all at the next opportunity. Yeah? <laughs>